Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Author Randy Alcorn recalled a two-month missions trip that he and his family took some years ago that included a visit to Egypt. While in Egypt, Alcorn's hosts took him to visit an abandoned graveyard located at the end of a garbage-lined alley. The host pointed out one tombstone in particular, that of William Borden, heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. William was a millionaire by age 21, but he renounced his fortune, giving nearly all his wealth to missions. His heart's desire was to take the gospel to Muslims in China. On his way to China, William stopped in Egypt to study Arabic, but four months later he contracted spinal meningitis and died at the age of 25. Alcorn writes this, I dusted off the inscription on the headstone of Borden's grave. After describing his love for Christ and his commitment to and his love for the Muslim people, the inscription ended with some words that set me back and I have never forgotten them to this day. The inscription ended, Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. And then Alcorn wrote, and I thought, Lord, what's the explanation for my life? To exhaust all our efforts in living only for self and living for the temporal things of this world only is not the purpose that God has placed us here. God doesn't want us to waste our lives. He wants us to use our lives for His glory and honor. The world looks at William Borden and says, How tragic! What a shame! What a wasted life! We look at it by the eye of faith and we say, What a testimony! What faith! What a life! The world who does not know our Savior or respect or live by the Word of God they often think believers are crazy that we live by faith in Christ and for eternal things that we cannot see. But we know that to live by faith in Christ and to live by the Word of God is to truly live for what is real, for what has meaning, and for what is lasting. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. The Greek word translated as beside ourselves means, in this context, to be out of one's right mind, to be insane, to be mad. Because of Paul's zeal for the truth and constant drive to live for the Lord and to get the gospel out to the lost and unbelieving, the Apostle Paul was viewed as being crazy. With his fervor for serving the Lord, he seemed like a man that was out of balance and fanatical to the world. In Acts chapter 26, we learn how Paul shared the testimony of his conversion before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. In verse 24 of that passage, we read that Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. This statement put Paul in the best of company. People also said that our Lord was beside himself and mad. Mark 3.21 says, And when his, that is the Lord's friends, heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. Likewise, in John chapter 10, verse 20, it says, And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Being called crazy for the sake of Christ is not an insult. It's a compliment for the believer. If people think we're crazy because we live for the Lord, that's a good thing. And so I called this message, Call Me Crazy, because that's okay to be called crazy. It shows that we're following the Lord. We're following His Word. Following the, the Lord and living by the Word of God will make us appear different to the world because we're not going with the flow, that strong flow of living according to the course of this world, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 talks about. 
And so when we're not going with the flow and going with the course of the world, it makes to the world, it looks like we're a bit off, like something's wrong with us and we're crazy. Dogmatism, belief that the Bible is absolute truth, also makes people think you're crazy. Dogmatism is uncommon and it's unacceptable in a society that demands tolerance. But when you say that based on the Word of God, something is the absolute truth, that too will make the world think that we're crazy. The Word of God, however, is an absolute. It is our first and final authority. When it says that there is only one way to God and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the truth, the absolute truth of the Word of God. And we must proclaim it even if people call us crazy. As we follow Paul as he followed Christ, as 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 instructs us to, we too, like Paul, should have a deep-seated devotion for the Lord, consumed with a zeal for the things of God, living for eternal, unseen things. This will make people think we're out of our mind, but that's okay. It's good to be called crazy for the Lord. Like Paul, we remember that if we appear to be out of our right mind because we hold nothing back and because we're zealous and we're dogmatic, he says, whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. In other words, it's to please Him, to honor Him and glorify Him. On the other hand, Paul, in the second part of this verse says, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Sober means to be of a sound mind, sane, in control. And so in this verse, Paul was saying that he appeared to be crazy and sane at the same time uh, to others. He was passionate, zealous for God, which made him appear uh, beside himself and crazy. And yet he was of a sound mind, modest, patient, gentle, in control, and ministering to the Corinthians and showing them God's love and grace, helping them to grow in the truth. Paul's behavior could be explained in one of two ways. Either it was zeal for God or it was for the welfare and good of fellow believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Paul goes on here to talk about his zeal, which was based on his concern for the eternal destiny of people's souls. And Paul says in his ministry that the love of Christ constrained him. To constrain here has the idea of holding in, keeping in, shutting in, in order to compel to a given end. It's like the wind that the sails in a sailboat catches that drives and compels that boat forward. It's also like a, a river with its banks. Unconstrained, a river would spread out into a marsh, but constrained, held by its banks, it flows to its given end. It's also like being in a large crowd, whether you're at a ball game or at the amusement park or if you're Christmas shopping, that you're held in and you're moved along and compelled forward with all the people that are around you going in the same direction. Paul says, the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ keeps us from wandering, from living an unfocused life. It catches us. It takes hold of our lives. It holds us focused and fixed on Him, and it compels us forward in living for the Lord. When Paul says the love of Christ, he's not talking about his love for Christ. He's talking about Christ's love for Him. In verses 14 and 15, Paul speaks of Christ's death for all. It was the love of Christ shown in the death of Christ that overwhelmed and drove Paul forward in his life and ministry. He was constrained in life and held captive by his gratitude for the love of Christ for him to live a passionate life for the Lord. Christ's love for Paul held him in a grip. It was the compelling force in everything he did. Christ's love for us, too, is to be our motivation, to compel us forward to live for Him. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 19, Paul says, That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. 
Paul said in Romans 8, verses 38 to 39, that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ's love for us is incomprehensible and unbreakable. It was knowledge of the truth of Christ's love and that out of that love, Christ voluntarily gave up his life on his behalf, a love expressing itself in a way that surpasses human comprehension. That love constrained Paul. Paul said that he was controlled and driven by this love that Christ had for him, and out of gratitude for that love, he wanted to give him back everything he had to offer. He wanted to give him back his life and his ministry as an act of worship, and we should do the same. As Paul contemplated the love which Christ had shown to him, he could not help but be moved along and driven in his service for his Savior, so much so that as he said in verse 13, people thought he was crazy and beside himself for how passionately he lived for the Lord. Paul says, because we thus judge, in verse 14, or we have thus concluded, he'd come to a settled conclusion, he'd come to a conviction. And the true conclusion by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And Paul's saying, let me explain to you why this love is so powerful to compel me forward in ministry. Let me explain to you why this love puts such extraordinary pressure on me to be grateful and drives me to live for Christ. And it's that one, that is Christ, died for all. Paul had a conviction about Christ and he also had a conviction about all men. And it's the truth, too. His conclusion is that if the death of Christ was for all, then it must follow that all were dead in trespasses and sins. Mankind as a whole is under the sentence of death. As God looks at men, all are spiritually dead, void of spiritual life. And there's nothing we can do about this in ourselves. We can't give ourselves spiritual life. We are helpless and we are hopeless. We are spiritually dead in our sins. And if Christ didn't die in our place for our sins, then we have to die for our sins, which means eternal death and separation from God in the lake of fire forever and ever. But praise God, one died for all. The power of Christ's love extends to all people. He died for all. And that love drove Paul to serve his Savior and reach out to all, knowing that Christ loves all and died for all, and his salvation from hell is available to all. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, Go to BereanBibleSociety.org. A Praying Life, True Spirituality and Prayer is a 50-page booklet written by Pastor Kevin J. Sadler. This booklet demonstrates from Scripture how God desires prayer to fill the Christian life. God hears and answers prayer, and He tells us in His Word to pray without ceasing and commune with Him continually, relating every experience in life to Him. There is no part of our lives that isn't prayer material. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255 4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And here Paul says, He died for all. Christ died for or in the place of all. He died in our place personally, my place personally, your place personally. This is substitution. 
Christ is our blessed substitute. He died as a substitute in our place. He bore a punishment that should have been ours. We should die. He dies for us in our stead. We should pay the penalty for our sin. He dies in our place and pays the penalty for us. And he satisfies the wrath of God against our sins with a perfect sacrifice in our place at the cross of Calvary. Christ died for all, for the world. He died for all people who have ever lived, who are living, and who will ever live. Every single person who lives in this world is born dead in trespasses and sins, and he died for the sins of every single person. Thus, Christ is the Savior of the world, the Savior for all men. His work is abundantly sufficient to secure the salvation of any and all who put their faith in Him. That truth of Christ's love for the world, that the scope of His love is limitless in dying for all, that the all included Christ dying for Him personally, the chief of sinners, all of this constrained Paul and it overwhelmed Paul and it kept him focused and driven to live for Him and to reach out to lost sinners with the good news of the free gift of salvation. The love the Lord had for him and for all pressed against Paul hard. It touched his heart. It kept pushing on him for him to share the love of Christ and his salvation with all people because Christ died for all. Verse 15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Paul's logical conclusion about the truth that Christ died for all who were dead in their sins and, couldn't, and could never save themselves is that we who have trusted Christ and who live and live eternally in Christ, we should not now live unto ourselves. We should live for Christ. We should live for our Savior. Christ saved us. We live forever in Him. We belong to Him. Now we should ask the Lord as Paul asked the Lord on the road to Damascus, Lord, what would you have me to do? What matters most now is to be His will, His purposes, His goals, His glory, His truth. Paul had a conviction that the redeemed who have been set free in Christ are not set free to live for themselves. We're set free to live for the one who died for us and who rose again. The Savior did not die for us and rise again so that we might go on living our lives the way we want to live them. Rather, He died for us so that we might turn over our lives to Him and devote our lives to Him out of gratitude, willingly, gladly, because of His love and saving us. It's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ gave himself for me. Now we are to give ourselves to him to serve and live for him. For Paul, there was no other option. There was nothing else but to live for Christ. So Paul lived for Christ and lived his love out through his concern through for the truth, his concern for the church, his concern for his personal testimony, and out of a tremendous burden for those who had not yet believed. After we get saved, our lives uh, should echo the words of Isaac Watts' hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It reads this in the lyrics, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? 
were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. The word wherefore points to a consequence from what was previously said. So in light of Christ dying for us and us living in him and living for him, since the time of conversion, since the moment we were saved and trusted in the substitutionary provision of Christ personally by faith, wherefore, henceforth, from that point forward, Paul says, know we no man after the flesh. We recognize no man now according to the flesh. We no longer evaluate people externally. We now have a new perspective on life and on people. We have spiritual knowledge and spiritual sight. We no longer see people purely from the outside. We no longer see them purely from the physical perspective in the light of their physical appearance and their outward behavior, their personality. That's not how we evaluate people anymore. You might have a neighbor who is very kind, who helps snow blow your sidewalk, who gives you a gift every Christmas time. You might have a co-worker who you've worked with for years who you know works hard and loves his family. You're at Walmart and the cashier is ringing up the things you bought and you're chit-chatting back and forth with them. And you look at these people in life, but now you have a lingering question in the back of your mind. Do they know Christ as their personal Savior? Now you see people as souls for whom Christ died, because we know Christ died for all, and because we know that outside of Him, people are dead in their sins and headed for the lake of fire. You can't take people at face value. You can't just walk away and say, well, that was a really great person. Instead, the more impressed you are about them, the more deeply burdened you become for them. You see people as people for whom Christ died because Christ died for everyone. On the other side of things, you see someone who is a derelict, who is a homeless person, who is a drug addict or an alcoholic, someone who just can't seem to get their lives straight. When you look at them, now there's an ache in your heart because you understand the answer and you know that Christ is the answer. And you know that the grace of God can save anyone and transform anyone's life. We don't see people according to the flesh henceforth or after we trust Christ. We no longer estimate people on the surface according to worldly standards. We no longer see people the way we once saw them. We don't see people on social, political, and racial terms. When you trust Christ, what you see is eternal souls who need Christ. You realize that every single person is important. Every single person is valuable and is someone for whom Christ died. This carries over to even among believers. No man, we see it henceforth. We know we no man after the flesh. That means even believers or unbelievers. So when you look at believers now, you look at them spiritually in terms of their walk with the Lord. Oftentimes, other believers challenge us spiritually by their faith. Other times, you see their struggles in their walk, and now you become burdened for them. Knowing no man after the flesh is about looking at the heart, because that's what God looks at. He looks at the heart, and, he de and it's about discerning spiritual conditions of people, looking at people like God does. After we get saved, we no, no longer look at life the way we used to. We have a whole new perspective to life. The new perspective carries even through, even to the Lord. He says, Yea, though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Before we were saved, we made a purely fleshly 
human assessment of him. To know Christ after the flesh means to evaluate him from a human point of view. Many out there know the stories and facts of Jesus of Nazareth. Many know that he was born in Bethlehem. He was laid in a manger, did many miracles, taught parables, was betrayed, crucified, rose again, and ascended. They know the facts. But after we are saved, we have a whole new, new view of Christ. It's one thing to know about Christ. It's another thing to know Christ. And after we get saved, now we know Him spiritually through a personal relationship that we have with Him by faith. We know Him as our Savior. We know Him as our living and exalted head of the church, the body of Christ. We know Him as our loving Lord. We know Him as our guide. We know Him as our all in all. The Breen Bible Society website has hundreds of Bible study articles on a wide variety of topics from Scripture. These are available for you to read, print off, and use for your personal study and encouragement. Or feel free to share them with others. Our website address is BereanBibleSociety.org. Thank you for watching Transformed by Grace. Next time we're going to be looking at the remaining verses of 2 Corinthians 5 and our calling by God to be ambassadors for Christ. The Berean Bible Society was founded over 75 years ago for the sole purpose of helping believers understand and enjoy the Word of God. Our organization holds without apology to all the fundamentals of the Christian faith, and we believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone, based on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also emphasize the importance of rightly dividing the Word of Truth and understanding God's Word in light of the Pauline revelation for today. Paul is the Apostle of the Gentiles, and it is our firm conviction that in his epistles alone we have the doctrine, position, walk, and destiny for the Church, the Body of Christ. And it is our firm conviction that in his epistles alone we have the doctrine, position, walk, and destiny for the Church of the Body of Christ during the present dispensation of grace. The mission of the Berean Bible Society is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ by proclaiming the whole counsel of God according to the revelation of the mystery. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.